conference today, cross-border payments, a new beginning. We have a fantastic panel with me today. Let me introduce my panelists. First, we have Dinell Dixon. And second, we have Jonathan Damapalan. And third, we have Rory McFakuha. And fourth, we have Renee Reinsberg. Now, Dinell is the CEO of Stella Foundation. She was the COO of Mozilla before that. Uh, Stella, of course, is a open source platform. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's a fantastic world out there. She will introduce uh, 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 to us how uh, Stella works. Uh, Jonathan has uh, had 25 years experience in telecommunications fields. He's the CEO and founder of eCurrency. Uh, now, eCurrency has been uh, a service provider and a solution provider to central banks to implement the CBDC solutions. Um, Rory uh, is the senior vice president with MasterCard. Uh, he was the senior director for global policy in Google before he joined MasterCard. Now, many of you uh, use a MasterCard. We know what a MasterCard company is, but you probably don't know that MasterCard now calls itself a global uh, multi-rail payments technology company. Um, and uh, least, uh, last but not least, we have Rene Reinsberg. Uh, he is the founder, he works in the C Lab, he's the founder of Tello. Now, Tello means purpose in Esperanto. You may know that uh, Esperanto is an artificial language designed or devised uh, to facilitate international communication. So we have a fantastic panel today. They will share with us our perspectives on cross-border payments, how the, uh, the market landscape will likely evolve in the next three to five years, uh, and uh, how do we ensure competition uh, in, this, uh, in this digital world? Uh, uh, you know, what, is, what, what is the role of standards and the interoperability uh, to ensure there is sufficient competition uh, in, in, in this uh, heightened uh, competitive age for cross-border payments. And, and the thirdly, uh, what is the role for public-private partnerships in ensuring that we have the best outcome, both in terms of efficiency and the stability of cross-border payments? Uh, now, before uh, I, uh, I ask the first question to my panelists, let me also emphasize, this is an important point, that ha having these fantastic guests to speak at the IMF event, of course, is our privilege. But I want to emphasize that it does not mean uh, that IMF endorses their companies or products. So that's an important point for me to emphasize. Now, without further ado, uh, let me invite uh, Dinell first. Um, to share with us your view. How do you see the cross-border payment markets uh, evolve in the next three, five years? So what do you think are the, the factors that would, would uh, you know, contribute to success uh, to companies like yourself? Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. It's such a privilege to be here. Uh, the, I think that the answer to that question, particularly the three to five years and what this looks like in three to five years, heavily depends on three things. I think you have to first consider uh, how good we are at developing easy use cases uh, for developers to be able to develop on top of our open source decentralized network and others that are out there. So that's the first issue. The second one is how much we focus on the use cases themselves. So solving real user problems versus focusing on the technology. Um, and then the third area is really this interoperability point and how good we are at enhancing the existing financial infrastructure that's out there versus trying to supplant it. So I think that it depends like how we approach each of these three areas. I hope that we continue to approach it from a use case piece versus looking at just trying to enhance this technology that's out there. Because if we are really trying to solve user problems and we do that with ease of use in mind, with user uh, looking at user interfaces and making sure that we're making them simple. Uh, and if we look and if we consistently focus on 
this notion of standards and interoperability, we are gonna get to the place where if we do this right, we'll get to the, the solution in three to five years that looks like a reduction in friction for the end user and for developers that are developing on these platforms. We'll get to cost efficiency that makes it so that we actually see a decrease in the, the, the cost for the end users with respect to these cross-border payments. And we will get to the place of enhanced competition and innovation. And I think that this is all good for the end user, because I think if we focus on each of these areas and we really, really try to make this a competitive platform that, that allows for awesome innovation, this is what we saw in the early days of the web when we saw interesting and different use cases that came to light because there was this focus on standards and innovation and competition. And the, the winner ultimately in that is the end user. So I look forward to three to five years out there and I hope that we've done all of these things and that we see this really vibrant marketplace out there of ideas of, and we see the cost efficiency that I think that we should see with respect to these pieces. Thank you, Dinelle. Um, I will come back with, uh, with a couple of follow-up questions, but maybe let me turn to Rory next. Just to ask you, you know, you represent uh, a very well-established uh, player in the cross-border payments market, that's MasterCard. Uh, now, how do you see going forward the relative comparative, adv comparative advantage of established players like yourself and I know that MasterCard has been, you know, rebranding yourself. Now you call yourself a technological technology company, uh, a multi-rail payments technology company. Uh, but there are, you know, new players like Stella, uh, like uh, Renee's uh, Tello, and uh, of course we have the Libra uh, that's sort of in the make, being, uh, you know, in the making. Uh, how do you see these relative players? Uh, compete, what's the comparative advantage uh, in this market? Thank you, Rory. So thanks a lot, Dong. And, and first of all, I'd really like to, to thank uh, the IMF, uh, to, uh, to, to thank Tobias, um, Managing Director Georgieva and others for uh, pulling together this conference. And frankly, I'd especially like to thank you for holding a private sector panel, because as the CPMI uh, report that is uh, being unveiled today uh, really underscores uh, there's no way of solving the problems of, of, of cross-border payments with the uh, public sector alone or, frankly, with the private sector alone. It really is going to take a very comprehensive, strong dialogue among all stakeholders to because this is a, an incredibly complex ecosystem with thousands of stakeholders, thousands of participants, and so moving that whole ecosystem along is going to take uh, is going to take dialogue. And so it's it's great to, to to be here and to be part of this conversation. Then um, to get to your question, I think uh, you know your your introduction already suggests that I'm not exactly going to accept the, some of the distinctions that you draw. So Mastercard is indeed we've been around for for more than 50 years but we are not sitting around and watching others innovate we are very central to efforts to innovate in the cross-border arena we have um i think the third highest number of blockchain patents of any company we are extremely closely involved in the fintech space we work we have a fintech accelerator uh that uh, that that reviews and invests in many of the most innovative companies out there. So, so we are very much uh, remaining on the forefront of, uh, of, of innovation in this space. You know, all that said, it has to be acknowledged that some of the new entrants, the new competitive players in cross-border, companies like TransferWise, co companies like Payoneer, have raised the game for the entire industry. They've created much better user experience. They've, they've reduced cost, created greater transparency. And that has had a knock-on effect on, on everyone involved. And frankly, as for Libra, if it weren't for Libra, it's not even clear we'd be having this conference today. So they deserve you know, a huge amount of credit for putting pressure on the public sector, established players to 
you know, really, really um, accelerate innovation. I'd say two more things. So first of all, I, I completely agree with the way the CAPMI has approached this overall effort, which is to pursue it in two parallel work streams. First of all, to address the large number of friction points in the existing system and see what can be done. And this is an area, again, where MasterCard is trying to innovate. We're trying to use our multi-rail capabilities. We have a product that enables lower cost, more predictable, more transparent uh, cross-border remittances um, and uh, en enabling uh, payment to literally billions of cards, accounts, uh, digital wallets, and, and uh, cash out agents. And then the parallel, the second stream, is to explore some of these completely transformative infrastructures, uh, such as the ones uh, represented by my colleagues on this panel. And, you know, they have huge promise. They are not going to be the be all and all end all. And we can't stop working on, for example, aligning AML standards across borders, because those are going to be a problem with any infrastructure. But it's, it's I, I think that what the CPMI has done is really identify the key set of problems and we all have to work together to solve them. Thank you, Rory. I really appreciate the points you have made, particularly that you know the competitive pressures from the new players have shaken up the established players. And uh, you know that's a very extremely interesting point. Uh, we'll come back to, to that, I think. But let me turn to Jonathan for, uh, now. Uh, you heard in the first panel that the the governors, uh, they are working very hard on potentially issuing CBDCs. So what do you think of, uh, you know, what kind of role do you think CBDCs can play in cross-border uh, payments? Uh, would they substitute or complement the private sector solutions? Um, grateful for, for you to, to, to share your view. Thanks, Dong, and thanks for the opportunity uh, to be here to address this. Um, so when you look at cross-border uh, and cross-border payments, we quickly get to the underlying factors that uh, are pervasive today in cross-border payments that make cross-border payments less efficient uh, and potentially more costly. Uh, the primary drivers there are settlement risk, counterparty risk, and the need to hang up a lot of liquidity to ex execute a cross-border payment. And the private sector is essentially left on its own to try to solve these problems. So where e-currency comes in, uh, and what we work with central banks on, is to make the central bank a, an important party in cross-border uh, payments, cross-border payments, and in fact, in central bank digital currency. By empowering the central banks to provide the ballast necessary in cross-border payments, you are actually able to bring down the risks, such as settlement risk, counterparty risk, and you can even eliminate some amount of liquidity uh, risks that are in the cross-border space. Um, and the way we solve it is with, with technology, by providing the appropriate security technology for central banks and the public sector to underpin cross-border payments. Now, very important here is that the private sector is not in any way eliminated in the process. The private sector also participates. In fact, the private sector executes the transactions. The central banks provide the ballast through central bank digital currency or a public sector bus that can enable cross-border payments, try and reduce or mitigate counterparty risk, try and mitigate settlement risk, and essentially take some locked up liquidity out of the system. Um, and, we, and we think we can do that to try and get central banks at the same level as the private sector uh, in enabling cross border. Thank you, Jonathan. Maybe I can uh, turn to Renee, uh, partly you know, in respond, responding to what has been said by the previous uh, three panelists, do you have any anything you would disagree? Uh, and and uh, you know, also I have this question that in, a, in, in some of the comments uh, out there uh, that you know, Tello is considered a a competitor or potential competitor to Libra. Now Libra, you know, has 
2.5 billion users already there uh, in the ecosystem. So how are you going to compete with that such a giant? Um, you know, in, in this kind of uh, uh, thinking, maybe you can share with us. Uh, uh, you know, your 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 thinking. How do you, how do you how do you fight that that battle? Thank you. Sounds good. And yeah, excited to be here. Thanks um, for uh, hosting us. Um, maybe just three quick points that cover um, cover uh, that a little bit. The first one, I think it's important to keep in mind that cross-border payments are actually expected to rise um, pretty, sig pretty significantly. Um, I recently saw a number by an official of the Bank of England who said that, you know, 2017, we had 150 trillion and over the next 10 years, so till 2027, 20, that uh, was expected to rise to 250 trillion, so an increase of over 100 trillion, which that's that's significant and actually you know even creates room for new solutions to to take up some of that uh space i think one factor that that we see a lot is the deterioration of correspondence uh banking that is particularly challenging for island nations and and so there are also new challenges that are kind of arising that can be addressed with uh with new solutions I would say, uh, and this addresses partly the Libra question as well, I think so much will depend on interoperability and um, and user experience, right? Um, and I'm, I'm not convinced that there's one solution, one kind of rail that is going to solve all use cases and be the best possible product for all communities. And so I think those who focus on interoperability, I think, actually have the best uh, chance of being an integral part of that fabric. Um, and I think that's um, less clear to me um, how Libra thinks about this, given that they're, you know, they're sitting on a phenomenal user base across Facebook properties. So maybe it's less prominent of, um, you know, sort of a concept to think about. But when you're small, um, you know, a small community like the, the teams building Cello, um, you have to think about, right, um, how do you plug into some of the other building blocks? And so from, from the get-go for us, uh, there's been a lot of focus on interoperability. Um, and in fact, one of the teams that um, has been building interoperability bridges between, for example, Bitcoin and Ethereum just decided to build a bridge between Bitcoin and, and Cello. Um, and, you know, we, uh, we see that happening a lot that now that even with, you know, starting within the crypto ecosystem, right, there's also, um, you know, a lot of work happening around establishing these bridges and giving consumers and giving users the option to more seamlessly use uh, different systems. Um, maybe, um, maybe one last, one last aspect, which is the user experience, which um, Danelle also brought up. I think this is where I see the biggest upside, right, and um, just hearing, um, we're seeing the user research in, in many markets around the world. Um, if we if we talk about, for example, remittances, one of the cross-border uh, payment use cases um, today, you know, we live in a world where, uh, in many places, you know, our our phone can can really you know do do anything, get us get us food delivered to your uh, to your to our house, um, but the 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 operations of actually getting money from A to B. Um, still haven't changed um, all that much. <clears throat> so I think this is where, I, you know, personally, I'm very excited to see um, what will be built on this new infrastructure. And I think that's where um, a lot of the uh, improvements can, can come in. Thank you, Renee. Maybe let me uh, turn back to uh, Danelle, also given your experience at Mozilla. Uh, so how do we ensure that in this new world we, ha we will have interoperab interoperability across different types of platforms? Now, I understand that Stella, on Stella itself, you have, you know, tokenization allows you to trade all sorts of tokens. Um, it can be CBDCs, cent central banks can issue CBDCs on your platform, if I understand correctly. But how do you actually scale it up? Um, and how do you ensure that, you know, if others, for example, MasterCard is also has launched a, a platform, as I understand it, for central banks to test their CBDCs um, uh, on their platform. Now, for a central bank out there, how do they decide? How do, you know, if I test 
on Stellar network, would that work also uh, on the Master ne Mastercard network? So you know that you know these are the issues from a practical point of view would be would be important uh, for for the policymakers to understand. Maybe we can start from uh, Dinell, then uh, maybe uh, swim back to to Rory as well. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Dong. This is such a great question, and it's one of the things that actually hits back to the question that you asked about Libra. I think that the focus that we have on open, decentralized, permissionless networks, which is what Stellar is, and which is what we focus on building, and we try to actually integrate with the incumbents, like with respect to MasterCard, for example, we have to make it really simple for, especially when you're when it's a new technology and you're actually trying to integrate with these different stacks that exist out there, you have to make the on-ramp to the, the network very simple. And that's where the interoperability and the standards come into play. And from just all of my years of focusing on standards, and this is what we did exceptionally well at the very beginning of the web and when we focused on the internet technology, there was a lot of a massive focus on standards and trying to build this ecosystem that anyone could join if they chose to. And all they needed was to understand like how to get onto the internet and then they could build their own website or they could build other engagements and opportunities with end users. That's what we're trying to do here and what we call the internet for payments. So it's the same idea. An open permissionless network is important and making sure that network is easy to interoperate with, which is what we try to do and strive to do here at, at uh, SDF and on Stellar, but lots of entities out there are trying to do the same thing. This is what creates the opportunity for there not to be a single incumbent, which I think is hugely important in this space. Because we've seen years later, 20 years later, with respect to the web, what happens when certain players take over and own all of the, the full stack, it makes it very hard for new ideas and innovation to come up. And so the idea is if we could continue in this space to make it simple and to create that interoperability and that focus on standards, then we actually can continue the, the, the notion of this innovation, which is crucially important to success here. Uh, so I think if you think about get the on ramps to seller, for example, making it easy for the for issuing tokens on and, and issuing value on Stellar is very simple. It takes one line of code to be able to issue whatever token you feel like is important for your business. There are gold tokens, there are silver tokens, there are USD tokens, uh, there are uh, there are fiat backed tokens that exist that I think are super useful and very similar to what CBDCs can be. In fact, you could see a central bank issue as a CBDC and then have the private sector and these fiat these entities out there that are exceptionally good at having that consumer focus, these fiat backed entities, they could actually be the, the, the glue for the consumer base and the CBDCs to be issued and used on a variety of different networks that are out there. So I think in all of the years that, uh, that I spent focusing on how to build standards, it takes that you can show the simplicity of it and then you come together and you really try not to be the winner take all model. You really try to understand that in this model, the winners are again, the ultimate either developers or the end users who are focused on uh, really trying to achieve these cross border transactions. And you really try to use that glue of making it simple and using standards to get there. Thank you, Dinell. Um Rory, so how do we, you know, given the importance that we should attach to interoperability, you know, want to, you know, the internet works reasonably well because, you know, we have the common standard, we have the common protocol. How do we go, you know, achieve that in the digital currency world in your view? So first of all, I, I would uh, completely agree with Danelle's point that interoperability in the in the area of, of digital currencies is absolutely critical. So it's hard to imagine a world in which governments have completely supplanted the private sector in the currency space. So a you know fully governmental monopoly is seems to be not realistic. Um, Governments aren't necessarily going to be the, the the best place to deal with things like user experience, to interface with customers, to innovate. Um, but conversely, it's also hard to imagine um, governments ceding control to a single private entity. 
And so the, the space in the middle where you have, on the one hand, competing private players, but maintaining a, a degree of interoperability so that you don't get these balkanized systems that, that um, can't, can't uh, transact with each other, that's, that's where we are today. And that's obviously the, the, the vision we should strive for for the future. The, the one thing that I would caution about the analogy with, with in the internet is that the financial system isn't, isn't a permissionless world in the same way as, as, as the internet is. Um, there are you know, very well-developed and frankly necessary regulations over, over money laundering, uh, countering the financing of terrorism, and and so on. And um, when when we looked at, for example, at the, the the first version of Libra, we just could not get ourselves comfortable with the idea that all of those concerns were were met in the structure that they were putting forward. And so so that was not something that we could be a part of. So so even as it's you know, vitally important, including in these conversations about central bank digital currency, to, uh, to, 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 to bear in mind interoperability, to make sure that you know, every private sector wallet that holds uh, a central bank digital currency can transact with, with a different wallet. Um, even in that world, it's like absolutely critical that we, um, we maintain a focus on, on compliance and on, on achieving the same standards as uh, as the financial sector, as, as financial regulators demand of the existing system. Thank you, Rory. So, Renee, uh, maybe I can come back to you. So, for a relatively um, smaller player, so how do we, you know, how do you see the the leadership role? Who is going to, you know, who should take the leadership role? How do we organize the discussions or the processes? processes to achieve uh, some standards or interoperability in the digital currency world? Thanks for the question. And this may be a good point to just give a little bit of context about Celo as well. So, you know, um, the three of three founders, uh, three of us started working on what has become Celo three years ago. Um, but over the last, especially last year, year and a half, since we open source the technology and launched the first sort of uh, test net, um, as it's called, before the, the full launch earlier this year, we've seen hundreds of organizations actually kind of join us and, um, and, and you know, start collaborating and contributing to, to Celo. So today, the Celo Alliance for Prosperity has over 115 members all around the world, and that includes, you know, big organizations like the Grameen Foundation that um, actually, it's just um, just started uh, using Celo and uh, Celo currencies uh, for a COVID-19 cash relief uh, program in the Philippines, um, all the way to you know some of the established kind of wallets and merchant operators out there. And I think that sort of ecosystem approach um, is really important first to to establish bridges to the to the established and existing um, financial players and, and ecosystem. Uh, but also, you know, because this is a task that's just too big for any one company or any one team to solve. Um, and so, um, so kind of more, more specifically kind of to your question, um, I actually, I would, um, I would probably push back a little bit uh, on what, what Rory just said in terms of uh, the financial system isn't or, or shouldn't be a permissionless world. And, um, you know, I obviously agree at, you know, at sort of a higher level that that, um, that has good reasons, but I think there's a lot of room for, for innovation in the permissionless um, side of this. And when we kind of think about uh, local currencies, functional currencies, community currencies, um, that I think we'll, we'll, we'll see an explosion of, uh, of currencies and digital assets happen just because they're uh, finally able to be used at a, at a much bigger scale through technology and most importantly on mobile phones. Um, and I think there's, uh, there's lots of good precedent, even with some of the mobile money systems, when it comes to, say, KYC, that, you know, if, 
if within a certain community there are transactions happening, you know, with kind of small sort of values, small amounts, um, that you know, one one can apply a slightly different system than if someone walks into a bank branch in in Germany or or in the United States. And I think um, I, I see us being at a critical point in time where we're finally, you know, we've been talking about blockchain uh, solving some of the problems around financial inclusion, for that to finally actually start happening. Uh, and um, you know, I think it's it's really important for uh, for regulators and lawmakers right now to 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 look at this and educate themselves and um, see what this technology can do before just applying um, just kind of a, an old framework to um, to this new technology. Um, specifically, I would um, I would I would say you know there's the point Danell made uh, earlier about uh, open permissionless systems. I think those are really crucial and critical, um, you know, and we're seeing this with Celo, but from a from an innovation perspective, there are, um, you know, people today building peer-to-peer -peer universal basic incomes on Celo, building uh, remittance solutions. They're, they're integrating locally in Kenya with M-Pesa, right? All these things happen when there's an open permissionless system. It's all stuff that I would have thought, yeah, is really great if at some point, you know, our team can do it, but, you know, we would likely never had gotten have never gotten to that point because we would have been busy solving other problems uh, first around the infrastructure. And so I think um, making sure from a kind of official sector perspective to encourage um, these open permissionless systems, I think I think is critical. Uh, second, I think is to to think about how to remove uh, barriers of entry for for new participants. And I think this is kind of the point about looking what's happened with with the web, right, where, um, you know, some of that has unfortunately gone wrong. And I think we have a chance to, um, to you know, we have a second chance here as we think about remaking the financial system. And third, um, I would I would say this is a great point in time, too, for, for the public sector to, to look at some of what's happening in the private sector and, uh, you know, embrace uh, you know, some of these newer technologies and, uh, and collaborate. I think, you know, at, at C Labs, uh, we have a lot of conversations where we're doing pilots um, with, with public sector entities. Um, my colleagues, uh, Jay and Ezekiel, are also part of several working groups at the ITU Standards Committee. And so there's, I think this is a very important time for, um, for everyone to come together and, and learn from each other, understand each other's perspectives. And uh, I think that will kind of lead to, um, to better outcomes. Thank you, Renee. Let me now turn to Jonathan. I think eCurrency has been talking to various central banks. You want to pr provide solutions on uh, central bank digital currencies. Now, imagine a world that you know, different central banks have issued their own C CBDCs. Now, if they are all of different designs, different standards, and if you want to trade them, that's not so different from the current system where you have to get a quote, you know, bilateral quote. It's, it's not a particularly efficient system if you need a lot of human intervention. So how do you actually get to a situation where these CBDCs can be traded automatically on a common platform? Have you know? Have you you know? Are central banks thinking about that problem, or what? What do you, you know? Do you have any views on that? The, the, the good news, though, is that central banks are thinking about this, and there has been a recognition that in the in the digital realm, uh, central banks need to, um, you know, quickly adopt a new new framework. Um, I, I know, as I'm listening to the other speakers uh, talking about currencies, it's a loose term. People just say, "Well, you can trade this currency or that currency." Or make up a new currency. Um, and we have to be careful when we talk about currency because currency is essentially a, a sovereign uh, instrument. Um, and in every country, it is underpinned by the law of the nation, or in some cases, the law of the union. And, and these currencies represent a liability on the central bank. It is not a casual, um, uh, instrument where you know someone wakes up and says, "Now I have cooked up a new currency because my uh, latest technology allows me to define it as a currency." It doesn't work that way. So you're, the point that you're raising, Dong, is that we have um, 
sovereign instruments that are underpinned by the law of the nation that creates a currency that works within the nation's boundaries. Now, rising above that, we have some international reserve currencies. So you have reserve currencies that are also recognized as assets by multiple countries. There are, uh, there are several of those. Um, and so for a transaction to take place from country A to country B, uh, it's not just a, a matter of uh, two uh, uh, currencies sort of coming together. It's a, it's a matter of exchanging from the originating currency into a reserve or a recognized international currency and then back out again. And this is primarily true in, in, in developing markets, in developed markets um, where the country's currency happens to be a reserve currency, well, there is essentially only one exchange that takes place or the recipient is willing to accept, accept the reserve currency. In the digital world, the question that you asked is, is quite pertinent. In the digital world, with two countries having a central bank issued digital instrument, how does that exchange happen? Now, the way we see it is that for that exchange to happen in an efficient way, number one, central banks have to participate. So this is not an exercise with just the private sector trying to make this happen. The, the bilateral nature of two central banks that are in the payment flow have to participate because they become ballast, uh, basically underwriting their own currency on what we call or what we would think about as an international cross-border bus. Once they are the ballast on, the, on this cross-border bus, private sector participants can participate because they're essentially regulated by their in-country central bank and the rules of the road are pretty well defined. Um, and so there can be a direct connection between private sector participants in country A and private sector participants in country B. In the middle, in the middle, there has to be an automated mechanism for the exchange to take place, meaning country A's originating currency gets converted into an exchange currency and country B then uh, subsequently uh, turns it back into, into the local currency. And this whole process can be automated as long as the security boundaries of the bus um, are, are, are secure so that the liquidity or the, the transaction within the bus can be ensured the exchange from A to B, uh, A to common currency, common currency back to B can take place. The, the participation of the central banks is what provides a ballast on this bus. Once a part, central banks are participating, the ability to execute from a CBDC in country A back to a CBDC in country B becomes eminently doable. The technology then that allows this to happen has to be essentially adopted by, uh, by the central banks. And this is what e-currency focuses on, is to really allow central banks to get up to par on the, on the technology such that the private sector participants, whether that be commercial banks, e-money operators, payment service providers, or even new entrants like some of my colleagues are, can then participate on it to allow for this cross-border uh, thing to happen. I want to go back to the original point I made uh, when I spoke earlier, which is eliminating the risk components, the settlement risk component, the counterparty risk component, and ultimately reducing the amount of liquidity needed to execute a cross-border transaction is what will bring the cost of cross-border transactions down and the risks associated with cross-border transactions down. So that's what we, we try to enable. Thank you, Jonathan. <clears throat> Does any of the panelists uh, have anything to push back against on what has been said so far? Renee? I have a quick rebuttal. Um, so I actually fundamentally disagree with, with Jonathan. Um, and you know, I, I grew up in East Germany where there was one um, TV station and one radio station. Um, and you know, there wasn't really much uh, much choice there. Um, but then it was the rise of the internet and obviously, you know, the wall the wall coming down, so it's good to know what would have happened. If, you know, without that, but you know, now everyone, every kid out there has a YouTube channel and you know, um, you know, a podcast, and and so we've we've seen just an explosion of um, you know expression and 
I, I think with currencies, uh, and I, I do use the term currency, um, I, I do see this similarly. I mean, currencies have been a thing before um, before central banks issued them, right? I mean, the first form of currency of money uh, were, were things like shells. And uh, today there are many examples around the world of, of things like local currencies actually really benefiting uh, you know, communities and uh, and even driving kind of you know GDP if that's a measure we're using for 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 uh, showing growth, and so I would say I think the only chance for CBDCs to um, actually be used from a retail perspective is to make sure they don't fall behind in some of the the benefits that these other currencies, uh, as we may want to call them, offer. Um, otherwise. Uh, you know, it may be uh, like the, the fate that happens to the, the state-owned TV channel, where it's 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 only used you know ten minutes a day versus the rest of the day is, is spent on, um, on 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 YouTube and um, and Spotify. So, I mean, that may be a little bit crass of a view, but I think conceptually, um, I do think that there there's just going to be a big uptick and um, an adoption of of these other currencies. And so, I think for central bank digital currencies. They need to kind of tap into, um, you know, all of the same kind of technologies and features. This is where interoperability comes in. But uh, this is also where um, I'm a big believer that um, they need to happen on open permissionless infrastructure. So, Renee, I would have fully expected you to disagree with me. <laughs> not really getting to this because I think this will be the fun part of this this conversation. So. Uh, I think there's a reason why we don't use uh, seashells anymore. So, uh, or, or coffee beans, or, or stones, or rocks. And the reason is that there is no underlying value associated with a seashell, or a rock, or a coffee bean. Um, and, and for the, for the same reason, you know, cooking up new forms of currencies, uh, just because we're able to give it a name, I, I believe will sort of take us back to the same place where there has to be some sort of underlying uh, underlying pretense for the existence of that currency. And the underlying pretense is not uh, not technology. The underlying pretense is re really the uh, the ability of a central bank to stand behind that currency and say, this is the currency of this country. And for in the early days of central bank uh, currencies, and, and I'm talking about physical currencies, the ability for central banks to do that uh, took a little while to uh, stabilize. But now, for the most part, with a few, very, very few exceptions around the world, central banks have successfully found a way to, to underpin that currency or their currency to essentially their balance sheet. I don't think we are going to rapidly go into a world where uh, we're back to seashells and coffee beans. Um, I think going forward, central banks will define their currencies, whether that be digital or physical, uh, in, in, in the form of paper notes and coins. And I think what we're talking about here is what happens in the cross-border space. The cross-border space, to some extent, is a bit of the Wild West because there is no one sort of essentially regulating that space. And I can see a lot of private sector companies quickly gravitating towards it. But ultimately, for that cross-border space to be a safe space to operate, central banks have to participate. Now, we can argue as to how they participate, but there has to be some common medium across which this takes place. And the common medium is not a private sector company, Facebook, showing up and saying, we will become the common medium. The common medium has to be a common medium that's not hijacked by the private sector. And that's really what we're talking about. And how can central banks enable that common medium to exist, but still allow private sector participants? And I agree that private sector innovation is really important here. But how do we allow private sector participants to operate across that common medium? The internet, by the way, is a, is, a, is, is a tricky subject because people throw the internet out as the way um, the, the future of uh, you know, central bank digital currency should work. But actually, even on the internet, there are certain common mediums that are essentially accepted and the private sector doesn't get to run off with it. So whether that be DM, uh, DNSSEC or it's 
um, uh, 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 the internet protocol or whatever. Those are accepted common mediums on which you're able to develop applications and allow YouTube to operate and for me to publish a video and so on and so forth. So those common mediums are really what we are talking about. And we can't run away with it and saying, well, the private sector is gonna go off and build its own common medium and then everybody else will sort of, you know, create their own currencies and, and off you go. Thank you, Jonathan and Renee for that exchange. I uh, very much uh, like that. Uh, now, um, maybe let me turn to Rory. So how do you, you know, I, I think what Renee is saying is that certainly in terms of services, features, uh, you know, private sector participants certainly have an edge because they have the, the, the um, uh, uh, incentives to innovate, to please customers. But you know, central banks would argue that you know we have uh, modern monetary policy that's based on economic science. We have forward-looking monetary policy. We maintain a unit of account that is very stable through business cycles, which is extremely important for for welfare, for public welfare. So, given all these different public policy, you know, policy objectives, do you see any way for the public private partnerships to work how do how do we how do how do they uh, how do central banks and private sector uh, or international institutions for that matter uh, collaborate in this space so as i said in my very first answer i think that um public private collaboration is absolutely critical in this area there's no no question about that and so i think that there's there's truth in what renee says there's truth in what what jonathan says and as usual, the right answer is somewhere in the middle. So, so there are absolutely areas in this space where the, the, the public sector has no comparative advantage. None of us want to have apps written by governments in our phones that basically look like they were written by the East German television company. And, um, but at the same time, you know, in terms of, of, of creating trust, in terms of uh, creating uh, uh, financial stability, macroeconomic stability, promoting uh, policy goals. You know, there's no disintermediating governments. Governments are there. They should be there. They and and so the key is 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 figuring out exactly where the lines are drawn, exactly um, how to how how governments can can incentivize private sector players, ensure. Uh, compliance with very important public policy goals like anti-money laundering, like countering the financing of terrorism. And so, you know, this is what this whole CPMI-driven process is all about. And it's very hard, and it's just starting. I mean, today is, is the launch of a roadmap, but the roadmap is just the first stage where you're looking at the map and you have the whole road to travel. And so, so all of us you know, on the in the in the public sector, on the in on the private sector side, we need to be be doing our our parts in this in this process. Now, um, you know, there are areas of this which are really the work has to be done by the public sector. So there's no question that in in things like harmonizing AML CFT, things like extending opening hours uh, of RTGS systems, that is the work of the public sector, and it will make a huge difference to this cross border space. On the other hand. You know, there are there are parts of this that are really um, private sector responsibility, like you know, harmonizing the ISO uh, 20022 data messages um, to make sure that there's you know much greater ability to to to, um, to much richer richer uh, messaging through the financial system and um, and mutual compatibility. So and and what the the public sector can do is it can convene. And it can drive this process forward, and that's essentially, I think, what th this conference is just one piece of. Thank you, Rory. I think this is a fan fantastic conversation. Unfortunately, we are almost uh, up in terms of uh, the time allocated to this panel. So let me give each panelist a maybe less than a minute uh, for you to summarize uh, and deliver the message, the key message you want to. Uh, audience to take away from this panel. Let me go to Dinell first. 
Thank you so much. There's so much to say on this, but I'll just say uh, two things that I think are really important. The discussion that was just had a few moments ago about not likening this to the internet and being careful of permissionless network networks. We have to remember that you're comparing this to Libra, which is a very different thing than what we're trying to focus on. Permissionless networks are the infrastructure layer that allows entities to build on top of them and to innovate and to create awesome ideas and to create products that are going to solve these problems that, that folks have all over the world and they're going to solve financial inclusion because you can do it on your phone. You can make it so that people don't have to have bank accounts and you can do it in three to five seconds. The comparison with the internet is that infrastructure layer, that technology layer. The, the notion that the AML and the um, on all of the different regulations need to apply here is absolutely agreed upon. And those financial institutions that touch, touch fiat on the edges are the ones that are regulated by all of the different geographies. So we cannot forget that that is the important piece of this. That is what creates the interoperability. That is what makes it so that this all works seamlessly. That is what makes it so that I could send Renee, a payment to Germany and to do that in three to five seconds and to still use the existing financial infrastructure, but to use these new rails, which make it faster, seamless and usable for the end for the, the developers and the end users. So that's just an important point. I want everyone to know governments are exceptionally good at regulating fiat. We still want them to. Thank you. Thank you, Dinelle. Jonathan. I think uh, two things. Number one. I think the recognition by central banks that they uh, are and will be entering the digital world is has been the most important uh, step, and we've seen that already, and we're very excited about it. Uh, and I think uh, you know e-currency's role here is to provide the technological capability for central banks to get up to par with uh, with the private sector. The second important thing, and and Dong. Uh, and the IMF here is, is really important, is that we're having this conversation. Uh, the conversation recognizes that central banks and central bank digital currencies are soon going to become a reality. And when that happens, how does cross-border work? And I believe, uh, as I've expressed before, the participation of central banks will actually eliminate the exposure and the risks associated with cross-border. And in the digital world, could actually iron out um, I iron out some of the challenges we have with cross border payments. So, uh, thank you, Don, for hosting this. Thank you, IMF, for hosting this conversation. As I think this uh, discussion at the public sector level is really important. Thanks. Thank you, Jonathan. Rory. So, I, first of all, um, again, I think that this is this 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 process. Uh, well, first of all, um, cross border payments huge number of stakeholders with very different um, strengths. You know, some of them are, are the innovators and the user experience and, and, and find, getting, reaching, reaching uh, unbanked people around the world. You know, that innovation must be preserved. And, and clearly, uh, some of the, uh, the most innovative companies are going to be fintechs, they're going to be nimble, they're, they're certainly not going to be overregulated to the point that they can't, uh, they, they can't do what they, they do best. On the other side, there are there are governments with sovereign interests. You know what exactly the the governmental infrastructure ends up looking looking like. You know it's it's building cross border uh, structures among governments requires a lot of trust among those governments, and we're not necessarily at a moment in geopolitical history where there's there's universal trust. So you know there are there are some very interesting experiments of governments basically. Uh, experimenting with taking over the the, the cross border payment rails. There's a, you know, between Thailand and and Hong Kong, there's a very interesting experiment. But it's complicated, and so in the interim, there's a lot of work that we can we can all do together in in incrementally improving the the, the current system. And I think that that's the agenda that CPMI has laid out so well. Thank you, Rory. Rene, less than a minute, please. All right. Um, yeah, just super quick. Um, thank you for um, for having us all, and I, I really enjoyed the, the conversation, the discussion. Hope it continues. Um, look, I, I think in a nutshell, open permissionless systems are, are critical. Um, I do see central banks uh, launch central bank digital currencies 
on open permissionless chains, whether that's Celo or Stellar. Um, but I but I think that's the future because so much depends on these being kind of breathing organisms that evolve over time that make sure that they can always guarantee the best end user experience. Um, and I would urge uh, regulators to, to to acknowledge and incentivize the development of um, of this. And you know, I think it's also a huge benefit from a risk perspective because of the public and transparent nature of these ledgers. Um, and so I think we're very early days. So a lot of this is education, 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 and and having that having those conversations. Um, I wouldn't actually want to uh, suggest that we should build these things today, um, but we should carefully think about how that kind of unfolds over the future and in collaboration with um, all these, these new um, uh, technologies that kind of arise. Thank you so much, Rene. So uh, just before I close uh, this panel, let me just advertise a little bit, you know, to, as part of the knowledge gathering and knowledge sharing education uh, process, we also published a paper today IMF staff paper, Digital Money Across Borders, Macro Financial Implications. It's available on the IMF website. So if you're interested, please take a look. And this has been a fantastic panel. Thank you very much uh, uh, for your participation. I learned a lot. And now let me close this panel. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Dom. Thank you.